Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of the Coastal State Discussion Series this spring. I'm Meredith Haas from Rhode Island Sea Grant, based here at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography, and I'll be your host for today. And the Coastal State Discussion Series is a forum dedicated to highlighting ongoing um, research that impacts Rhode Island coastal communities and environments. And so if you want to find more information about this series, you can visit Sea Grant's website, where you'll also find uh, recordings and information from past series discussions, as well as updates um, on upcoming webinars and other events. And on behalf of Sea Grant, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's talk, the University of Rhode Island's College of Environment and Life Sciences, and the Graduate School of Oceanography, as well as the EPSCOR Sea AIM Consortium. Now, before we begin today, I just want to provide a quick overview about um, how today's program will go. First, the presentation segment by our guest speakers will be about an hour in total, followed by an hour long Q&A where we will field questions from you, our audience. So during the presentations, please feel free to share your questions and comments. Uh, using the Q&A and chat options found at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining us from Facebook today, um, you can share your comments and questions there as well. And we will do, we will do our best to get to everyone's questions during the Q&A portion. Um, and today's webinar will also be recorded and live casted on Sea Grant's Facebook. And the recording will be made available on Sea Grant's website um, and social media outlets at a later time this month. So just stay posted for that. Um, and now on to um, why we're here today. So today's discussion, we're going to look at the ongoing research of phytoplankton, which are these tiny microscopic marine plants, some of which cause harmful algal blooms in Narragansett Bay. And in particular, we're going to be discussing uh, the diatom pseudonychia, which can produce a neurotoxin called domoic acid. This can accumulate in shellfish and potentially cause illness in humans and marine organisms if ingested. And fun fact, Pseudonychia actually inspired Alfred Hitchcock's famous 1960 film, The Birds, after an event in Monterey Bay where seemingly crazed birds were seen crashing into buildings, cars, and street signs. Now, scientists believe that the cause of this event was from the ingestion of domoic acid from infected anchovies near the coast, which caused confusion and disorientation in many of the coastal seabirds. And while Pseudonychia has been detected in Narragansett Bay for well over 50 years, it wasn't really until 2016 and 2017 um, where detections of demoic acid brought about some of the most extensive shellfish closures in Narragansett Bay. Now, the cause of these events is unknown, uh, prompting research to better understand these species and predict future harmful algal blooms. So joining us today to discuss some of this research is Dr. Bethany Jenkins, a microbial ecologist and professor of cellular and molecular biology at the University of Rhode Island, um, as well as Alexa Sterling, who is a PhD candidate working under um, Dr. Jenkins. And together they will discuss their work looking at the distinct assemblages of pseudonychia and the potential causes of that demoic acid production, such as environmental factors or the potential introduction of a new toxin producing strain. And Dr. Colleen Mao is joining us today from the Graduate School of Oceanography here at URI and she will be sharing complementary work identifying and monitoring uh, phytoplankton species using satellite and submersible imaging sensors to better capture the composition diversity of species found in the bay, as well as provide real-time characterization of phytoplankton that will allow for a rapid response to target harmful algal bloom events as they occur. And so with that, um, I would now like to hand it over to uh, Dr. Jenkins and Alexa, who will be discussing their work first. Hi, everybody. I wanna thank you all for signing in and spending your afternoon with us to learn more about the ecology of harmful algal bloom species in Narragansett Bay. It's a real pleasure to be with you. And I'm gonna turn on my screen sharing so that I can show you some images of what we would like to discuss with you. So this scientific effort is due to um, the hard work of a lot of different individuals. 
Um, I'd like to first thank my co collaborator, Matt, Matthew Burton and his group. They're the ones that are measuring toxin. And I hope some of you got a chance to um, check in with Matt's uh, discussion series um, presentation when he gave it, it was fantastic. And so he talked about a lot about the devonic acid and how he makes the chemical measurements. And so if you missed that, please check out his recording. You can see these, this is a team. This is a team of agency scientists, other scientists at URI, lots of um, graduate students and undergraduates. And I can't um, also wanna acknowledge our funding sources, Sea uh, Grant for funding this work, EPSCOR Rhode Island CAIM for funding this work, and the National Science Foundation for some funding some of our time on this work and, and some of the offshore sampling we've done. So I'd like to share with you some of the brilliant faces of, of some of the people involved with this work. And as you can see, this is a team effort. It involves captains, undergraduates, co-PIs who also drive boats, which is pretty fun, and um, a lot of great field work on Narragansett Bay. And one of the things I wanted to highlight, and you'll see Alexa's presentation, is the role of graduate students in this kind of research. This is a, a, what I consider really a graduate student-led project. This is Alexa in the top right, sampling Castle Hill in the winter, all bundled up and wading in to get some water samples. And you know, a lot of us that work in coastal ecosystems really care about this research. We love to eat the shellfish that's produced and harvested here in Rhode Island. And Alexa is about to dive into some, some beautiful oysters which are locally grown here in Rhode Island. So the target organism that, that Alexa and I will be talking about today is a diatom called Pseudonychia. We know it's got a funny name. And one of the reasons it has this funny name is it's a hard diatom to distinguish from cousins using the microscope. So we've got a nice cartoon here. And we'll loop back to that in some of our detection methods and why they're important. This diatom produces a toxin called domoic acid. And this domoic acid molecule is shown here. And the reason I'm showing this molecule is I want people to see that it's a small molecule relative to some of the other algal toxins if you've got L expertise in, in, in algal toxin ecology. So it's a small molecule produced by this diatom. And what makes it particularly tricky to study is that different species of pseudonychia vary in their toxin production. Some are considered very high toxin producers, others are considered low toxin or undetectable toxin producers. The other tricky thing is the toxin producers don't always make toxin. So you can have toxic cells in the water and they may or may not be making toxin. And you might say, well, what triggers them to make toxin? And the short answer is a lot of things and it makes it hard to predict. And so I've got this um, wave diagram here that shows that different nutrient conditions in the laboratory have been shown to lead to toxin production when they run out temperature, salinity, and pH in the environment are thought to lead to toxin production, and partnerships with other organisms such as bacteria can influence toxin production. So this is a complicated thing where we have different species that make different levels of toxin, and then regulation of that toxin in the environment. So when we, when we bring domoic acid into the environment, what does it do? You heard about the birds and Alfred Hitchcock. It causes a disease called amnesic shellfish poisoning, which is as bad as it sounds. It impacts our brains through neurochemistry. And this impacts seabirds, sea mammals, and humans if we were to eat shellfish that have accumulated domoic acid. So the domoic acid is in the plankton, in the pseudonychia, and when you have um, things like shellfish that are bioconcentrating and eating this plankton, they accumulate this toxin in their, in their meat. And so that, that contaminated toxin can go up into the food chain. So interestingly, the first domoic acid poisoning cases in humans were shown on the East Coast of the US. And this is our, our Canadian uh, maritime neighbors up in Nova Scotia. And the first reports and the first real human impacts were noticed off the coast of Prince Edward Island after people reported eating mussels. There were seizures and people died from this. And so these reports came in really quickly after folks ingested these contaminated mussels. And you can see a picture Alexa has now of a light micrograph of um, one of the Pseudonychia species. 
So the other thing that's incredible, this is a really rapidly act, acting toxin. And so this graph shows from this New England Journal of Medicine paper, the number of cases and the time from consumption to first symptoms. So if you eat something and feel funny, maybe 48 hours later, probably not pseudonychia and, and domoic acid poisoning, right? You can see from these cases that are reported that this is a very rapidly acting toxin in humans, which also means it's a rapidly acting toxin in sea mammals as well. So we think of this as potentially a concern and an emerging problem, and, and researchers are thinking it's getting worse in response to warming ocean. There have been reports, particularly where it's well studied in the ecology is a little more advanced because it's a bigger problem out on the west coast of the United States that there's um, a warming Pacific and, and elevated demoic action, acid um, uh, getting into the plankton fraction in this ecosystem. And so this is a recent paper that just came out from Vera Trainers Group up, up in Washington State. And these first two panels from her paper show you in panel A from 2002 to 2013, the, the temperature. And so cool, cool colors mean colder temperatures, warmer colors mean warmer temperatures. And the panel B, the right panel, is showing you that in 2014 to 2019 in the same area, there's been a very um, marked increase in what we call sea surface temperature. This panel here shows the difference. And so again, this color is indicating warmer. And so there's about a one degree uh, centigrade difference in these, these ocean waters. And this is a lot of temperature difference in such a big system in these, in these time period changes. So when we look at the corresponding domoic acid, and so now the right panel is the, the, the particular DA. So this is the domoic acid that's associated with plankton in the same time period. So this is 2002 to 2013, pretty darn low. When we get into this warmer area, this is where they're seeing these hot spots of domoic acid. So the domoic acid is much higher in response to this warming temperature. So what's going on on the East Coast? So why did we start doing this research? Well, we started it recently because it only became we, what we think of as a problem real recently. So the first reports were in the fall of 2016, and this was the first Rhode Island closure no, known due to domoic acid. And this was what we consider a regional closure because it impacted Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine. And you can see the, the press associated with that. When we look at the coastline, there were high pseudonychia cell counts and toxins up and down the East Coast in the fall of 2016. There was another closure in the spring of 2017, and this was in Rhode Island. This closure was now restricted to Rhode Island, which is pretty interesting. So our neighboring states didn't see that, but the shell fishery harvests were closed due to the presence of domoic acid. So the regulatory um, measures are to close the fishery when this is around in the water because you certainly don't want it in your shellfish supply to humans. And in that 2016 um, closure that was in Maine, they actually had to recall seafood that already went to market. So we're trying to help uh, our Rhode Island fisheries not ever have to do that because it, it costs them a lot of money. And so I think many of you on this um, webinar will know that uh, shellfish is super important to the economy of Rhode Island. So there's millions of dollars in wild harvest, there's millions of dollars in aquaculture, and sales that go nationwide. So a big question you might ask is with these recent blooms, are pseudonychia species, the agent of demoic acid production, new in the Narragansett Bay ecosystem? Well, we can answer this pretty easily because Narragansett Bay is the home of one of what we call the longest running plankton time series in the world. And that data goes back 50 years. And this is cell counts of different species. So when we look at this data, you can see in this animation that Alexa created for me, going over time, the data we're showing here is from 1999 to 2017, there are high abundances of pseudonychia that do not have corresponding toxin production and harmful problems. So this is not um, a new species group to Narragansett Bay. It's been around and it's been around in high abundances. And this is 
data going back to 1999, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the time series, we see that these, these cells are present. So when we started this research, we had some tools we thought we could use to answer this question, both with the chemical measurements of domoic acid by the Burton lab and by genetic measurements conducted by my laboratory to really ask, okay, we know that, that pseudonychia as a group have been around. I told you they're hard to distinguish using a microscope. So are there new species present that weren't there before? That's one of the questions we wanted to address. And is the environment changing in a way that influences domoic acid production? So we are tracking the pseudonychia using genetic methods in partnership with the Burton lab, who's using chemical methods to measure domoic acid at, at very high resolution and, and time scales. And then we're gonna take both of these data sets and compare them to the environment. And Alexa will tell you more about that. I wanted to show you one of the new tools we developed. And this is, um, I think you were in an era of COVID testing, which uses genetic markers to detect the presence of that virus. We do something similar and that we take advantage of a molecule common to all cells and a region in that molecule that's different between pseudonychia species and we conduct high throughput sequencing. And that tells us at a very high resolution what species might be present. Alexa's got more information about that method. So we can go with this data and start looking and maybe trying to predict temporal patterns in toxin production and pseudonychia species that might be problematic. And then we can start look at, looking at ecological drivers. So with that, I'll leave the rest of the floor for Alexa. And please put your questions if you have any in the Q&A and chat. And thank you very much. Alexa, it's, it's, it's yours. Thanks so much, Bethany. Let me just adjust my view so I can read my notes. Perfect. Thanks, Bethany. I'm Alexis Sterling and I'm working on finishing my PhD dissertation and I'm so excited to share these results that Bethany has been alluding to. This is my favorite dissertation chapter, don't tell the other ones. But for this project, we sampled weekly in Narragansett Bay from 2017 to 2019. And the sampling is still ongoing, but this is the time period I'll focus on the results for. So Narragansett Bay is a productive estuary ecosystem with input, inputs from the north from the Providence River and inputs from the Atlantic Ocean in the south from the Rhode Island Sound. The site that we sampled most frequently was in mid Narragansett Bay at the GSO time series, which like Bethany said, has been sampled since 1950s. And we use similar methods that they used. We also sampled at the mouths of the passages, the entrance to West Passage on the left and the entrance to East Passage on the right. Uh, and the sampling at the West Passage entrance was made possible by the GSO fish trawl. In total, we collected over 300 samples for domoic acid measurements. Specifically, these measurements are of the cell associated toxins in the plankton communities of the surface seawater. We did not regularly sample the shellfish meat for toxins. However, there was one time in our time series because of elevated cell associated toxins and cell counts in June 2019 that we did decide to take a handful of mussels from the GSO dock, which I'll talk about later. And then we also analyzed over 200 samples for high throughput DNA sequencing of the ITS-1 region to identify the different specific species of pseudonychia present. And I'd like to say thank you to the Rhode Island Genomics and Sequencing Center and especially Janet Toyin for helping me as I develop these new methods. From this DNA sequencing data, I was able to identify 19 known pseudonychia species in our samples across the two years. All the samples had at least two species present and it's important to know that for all these graphs of cell counts I'll be showing, we're talking about multiple species present at the same time, but it's lumped together as one genus Pseudonychia. First, I'll be focused on three major research questions. From our 2017 to 2019 weekly sampling, where we had no closure events in Rhode Island, what were the baseline patterns of Pseudonychia cell counts and cell-associated domoic acid? 
Next, which toxic species of Pseudonychia were present in Narragansett Bay and what environmental factors that we sampled may correlate with this toxin production? And lastly, which Pseudonychia species were present during the 2016 precautionary closure and the 2017 closure in Narragansett Bay? So first I'll dive into these baseline patterns. Bethany showed this graph from the GSO time series. And as we can see, the orange line along the bottom is the action threshold set by Rhode Island DEM that would trigger additional testing for toxins. Every year at the GSO time series site, the cell counts exceed this action threshold, but we've never had a shellfish closure prior to 2016. And this isn't for lack of monitoring. Rhode Island DEM has been monitoring since the 1990s. Um, so like Bethany said, something must have changed. Across our 2017 to 2019 time series at the three major sites, we took Pseudonychia cell counts. I'm showing the GSO time series along the top, the West Passage entrance in the middle, and the East Passage entrance on the bottom. Gaps in the line indicate pauses in our sampling, especially in the winter at the entrances of the bay. The higher the peaks, the more Pseudonychia cells are present. Cell counts again exceeded the action threshold every year too, with some of the highest counts at the mid-bay site of the GSO time series. Once I even counted a chain of 20 pseudonychia cells in one sample. That was pretty cool. <laughs> now I've combined the graph along the top with the three sites overlapping. Counts of pseudonychia cells rose, especially in the fall and summer months, which was a pattern that I also saw in the historical cell counts from the GSO time series. Now the graphs on the bottom show the cell associated demoic acid concentrations with the GSO time series at the top, the West Passage entrance in the middle and the East Passage along the bottom. First, I wanna point out that there are long periods of very low or undetectable toxins. The highest toxin concentrations observed were in the fall and summer months, just like the cell counts, especially in September, October, May, and June. The highest observations were at the Bay entrances especially in West Passage in 2017 on the left. During this period, interestingly, cell counts at West Passage were below the action threshold. For context, knowing these measurements, none, none of these measurements are of closure concern, but they do show off the sensitivity of our mass spec method. Our highest mass spec me measurement in West Passage in 2017 is about five times less than what would likely yield a positive result on a Scotia rapid test. The Scotia rapid test is used by Rhode Island Hab Monitoring and a positive test of that triggers shellfish meat testing. So our measurements that I show here likely would not trigger testing of the shellfish meat, which explains also why we didn't see closures during this time, but they do uncover patterns of cell associated toxins that we would otherwise not know from routine testing and monitoring. So this event in June 2019, we were especially curious about when we could anticipate from previous years of sampling that cells would rise and so would cell associated toxins. So we decided to collect six mussels from the GSO dock, where on the map I've pointed out where that is on the right. All the mussels did have detectable demoic acid, but the highest amount was 5,000 times less than what would trigger a closure uh, based on FDA regulations, making these mussels safe for consumption. Mussels in particular are interesting because they're known to quickly take up the toxin and all, and I'd like to know that all shellfish can purge the toxin with time and become safe to eat later, left in the water alive. So in conclusion from our first research question, we determined that pseudonychia cells and toxin rose in the fall and summer months. While pseudonychia cells sometimes exceeded the count action threshold, all of our mass spec measurements of demoic acid were well below le levels of concern during this time period. And notably, all the tested shellfish meat we did with our project was safe for consumption. Next, I'll share what pseudonychia species were present during this time frame and what environmental factors may have correlated with toxin production. To examine the correlations with toxin production and environmental factors, I used a principal component analysis or PCA shown blank on the left. I'll show all of our samples from 2017 to 2019, each as a single point. 
please note that the closer the points are to each other on the graph, the more similar they are. Each point is the full set of environmental parameters we measured, which are included in the list on the right, like nutrients and water temperature. I'll also be showing the Pseudonychia species composition beside the PCA by season. These seasonal assemblages were st statistically significant and every sample had multiple species of Pseudonychia detected. Multi-species assemblages of Pseudonychia have been previously observed in other ecosystems like the Gulf of Maine. I'll be showing these species along the x-axis, which were common in over 20% of our samples. The size of the bubbles next to the species name indicate how many samples per season they were detected in. The larger the bubble, the more common that species was that season. One of the benefits that we found of using DNA sequencing was that we were, we were able to uncover previously undescribed diversity in Pseudonychia species. For example, there are DNA sequences I found in our data set that belong to Pseudonychia, but I could not confidently identify as any of the currently known species. This potentially new species that I've circled here on the graph is 95% uh, similar to Pseudonychia americana and may be a close relative. We hope that our efforts to capture these diatoms into laboratory cultures will tell us more about it. Of the species detected throughout this time series, most are known to be able to produce domoic acid. These I've bolded and highlighted in red. And from other researchers' work, we know each species is likely to produce different amounts of domoic acid and their toxin production may be triggered by different environmental factors. I've added in the samples from the fall and these had the highest toxin concentrations and they grouped together on the PCA on the left. The fall had the highest number of Pseudonychia species present and it was common for Pseudonychia pungens, multi-series, Calliantha to be detected. Interestingly, the notorious toxin producer Pseudonychia australis at the top of the graph was also detected. Now the samples from the winter also grouped together on the PCA plot and typically domoic acid was not detected in the winter or was very low even though there are still toxin capable species present. Notably, the non-toxic Pseudonychia americana was the most common in the winter samples, but P. australis still persisted. Spring samples also group together and overlap with some of the winter samples. There is a noticeable shift in the Pseudonychia species composition with Pseudonychia pleuriseca and Pseudonychia delicatissima appearing, which are both toxin producers while P. australis still continues to be detected, although in less frequency. The summer samples complete the graph and they group together and also overlap with the other adjacent seasons. There's strong seasonal patterns of environmental variables in Narragansett Bay shown by the PCA. And the Pseudonychia species present in the summer are similar to the spring and fall species. Now I've colored the PCA graph by whether or not domoic acid was detected in a sample. Red points indicate that those are toxic samples, and these toxic samples group on the right, which were mainly in the fall and the summer. I've added arrows, which represent the correlations to the environmental parameters that we measured in the field, and I've added those as a reminder on the right. First, I'm showing the label of the arrow for domoic acid concentration. The relatively short size of this arrow indicates that domoic acid overall had little impact on shaping our seasonal data set but it does point towards our most toxic samples in the fall and summer, which is expected. Next, I've labeled the Pseudonychia cells correlation, and it's in the same direction as the toxin arrow, suggesting a positive correlation with increasing cells and increasing toxin. Next, I've added in two more labels of interest, nitrate and water temperature. Water temperature at the top had the largest impact on dimension one of the PCA, indicating its influence on the seasonal shaping of the data set but temperature overall did not appear to influence toxin concentrations, unlike what Bethany alluded to on the West Coast. The nitrate arrow is an opposite of the domoic acid arrow, suggesting an inverse relationship, whereas toxin increases while nitrate decreases. It's important to note that correlation does not equal causation, but this at least gives us an environmental parameter to hone in on as we perform future laboratory experiments on Pseudonychia cultures and an idea of what the Bay environment looks like when cell-associated cell associated domoic acid is detected with low nitrate. 
Overall, the common species of Pseudonychia in the bay that make up likely the resident population are Pseudonychia multi-series, Calliantha, Americana, and Pungens. Um, and I also wanna highlight this new species, potentially new species uh, that was present in almost 30% of our samples. We also identified eight species in our data set, which had never before been observed along the Eastern North Atlantic coast, likely due to the high throughput nature of DNA sequencing. And these included four toxin capable species, but overall none of these were frequently observed and occurred in less than 16% of samples each. Then I'd like to point out the notorious Pseudonychia australis again. It was first documented in the region in 2016 in the Gulf of Maine and Bay of Fundy. It was present in 23% of our samples from 2017 to 2019 in Narragansett Bay. So overall from all of this, we see that multi-species assemblages shift each season. The DNA sequencing methods uncovered a potentially new species of Pseudonychia americana and it helped increase the understanding of species new to the region, which included four toxin capable ones, although those were quite infrequently seen. And lastly, we found a correlation between the two year data set with increased cell associated toxin and decreased nitrate. These toxin concentrations were well below closure level concerns, but this relationship makes nitrate especially inter interesting for us to test in laboratory cultures and may be an environmental parameter influencing toxin production by the resident species in Narragansett Bay. So finally, I'd like to present what we found as species present during the two closures. The precautionary closure in Rhode Island started with the closure north of us in Maine, when domoic acid exceeded the action limit in shellfish meat and five tons of shellfish were recalled from market. Later, the closure extended to both sides of the Bay of Fundy when shellfish meat exceeded the toxin limits there. And it was noted that Pseudonychia australis was present in both Maine and Canada samples from this time period. Because of what was happening in the region and high cell counts in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, there was also toxin detected that was cell associated in the phytoplankton and there was some toxin below the action limit in the shellfish meat. So there was precautionary closures put into effect in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And we wondered could Pseudonychia australis be the causative agent as well. We were the first to sequence samples from Narragansett Bay during this time. And we found that Pseudonychia australis was not in any of those samples. There were 11 different species present during this time with nine as known toxin producers. And as expected from the fall resident species that I've shown, Pseudonychia pungens was present in every sample, but so was Pseudonychia cuspidata, which is a known toxin producer, but very rare in our two years that we looked at in less than 5% of our samples. Overall, this showed that Narragansett Bay had different toxin producers present than Maine and Canada, which may have influenced the different closures. Later on in March, 2017, there was a shellfish closure that only impacted Rhode Island. And this time it did exceed the shellfish meat limits. And this was the first time that this happened in Narragansett Bay. Samples were taken by Rhode Island DEM and sent to Dr. Kate Hubbard for DNA analysis. She found that Pseudonychia australis was present in this 2017 event, along with other species. We sequenced these same samples with our methods, as well as additional samples from the GSO time series, and also confirmed that Pseudonychia australis was present in almost every single sample, along with other common toxigenic uh, species from the two-year data set. It's likely that Pseudonychia australis was responsible for this closure and is a problem species to look for in the future in Narragansett Bay. So in conclusion, Pseudonychia australis was not in any of the 2016 samples from the Rhode Island precautionary closure, but the rare Pseudonychia cuspidata was in all of them. From the 2017 closure with toxic shellfish meat, which did not extend north, Pseudonychia australis was found in almost every sample. Overall, Pseudonychia australis is a worrisome new species for Rhode Island and the region. It was infrequent in our two years of sampling and only 23% of those sequenced samples. And during that time, there are no toxin measurements close to closure concerns. 
This project has provided us with an important two-year data set of cell-associated toxin levels below closure concerns and the makeup of those toxic pseudonychi assemblages. It gives us future questions to investigate like the influence of nitrate on toxin production and species-specific toxin production. The Rhode Island HAB monitoring program is robust and ready to protect Rhode Island lives and livelihoods while we provide this important baseline context for any future HAB events. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's helped in addition to the amazing co-authors who helped in the sampling, sequencing, design, and funding of this project. And a special shout out to the captain and team on the Captain Burt who make the GSO time series and West Passage fish trawl samples possible. Now we're going into our fourth year of data collection and the project keeps on going. So thank you. And I will pass it on to Dr. Mel. Okay, let me just queue up my slides here to share. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, a different tool that's being used in the Bay to detect harmful algal bloom events. Um, I'll talk a bit about Pseudonychia, but there's some other species that we're able to detect that I think will be interesting to you as well. And this is, um, of course, a effort that took many, many people. We're continuously running these uh, observations. So there's always something uh, that needs attention, weekly maintenance that happens. Um, but I'm sharing this uh, presentation with the co-authors, Audrey Ciacchetto, who is our, our laboratory manager, Audrey, um, sorry, Virginia Sonnet, who's a PhD student in my lab, Jessica Carney, who uh, completed her master's thesis in my lab, and Simong Song, who has just uh, recently joined us. So what you're seeing here is uh, some examples of the incredibly diverse um, taxonomy and morphology of the uh, phytoplankton that we find in Narragansett Bay. So while the, these are quite impressive, the majority of the community actually looks like this. Um, these are very small cells, more on the order of five to 10 microns that are very difficult to differentiate with uh, some of the technology I'm going to show you today. Um, but I'm gonna focus on some of the HAB species that we are able to detect. And those include what you see there at the top, Margolephidinium, um, which produces a hydrogen peroxide-like toxin. It exudes rod-shaped filaments from their trichocysts and can clog gills of filter feeding organisms. This species is also quite slow growing with uh, about uh, 0.3 divisions per day under optimal conditions. So compared to diatoms, which undergo multiple divisions today. Um, so in order to compete with those faster growing phytoplankton, this dinoflagellate produces allelopathic chemicals that inhibit the growth of other phytoplankton. In the middle there, you see pseudonychia uh, that you became very familiar with from our last presentation. So I won't give you any more background there. I will say that we are not partitioning uh, Pseudonychia into all the different species that Alexa just shared with us. We're just collectively um, considering them as a group. And then finally, Dinophysis. It produces um, ochaetic acid and leads to diuretic shellfish poisoning. So how we're looking at all of these different images that you just saw, um, this being collected with an instrument called the Imaging Flow Cytobot, and as an abbreviation, I'll refer to it as the IFCB. This instrument is able to image cells within the size range of around 10 to 150 micrometers. It's done by a combination of um, flow cytometric and video technology. Uh, here you can see sheath fluid and those black arrows moving down through the center of that uh, diagram. Uh, that help align the cells within the flow and ensures that the cells are in the focal plane to allow high resolution images of a single cell at a given time. Uh, there's also laser induced uh, fluorescence and scattering that's used to trigger the targets. So we're just acquiring phytoplankton images uh, rather than all particles in the water column. Um, what results is thousands of images per sample, which are about a 15 milliliter sample. And the instrument is able to sample at a frequency of about every 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the number of cells that are 
in the sample resulting in the beautiful images that, uh, that I've been sharing with you. So this, where this instrument's located, it's uh, in a, uh, uh, what, I, what we call the shed down on the uh, Graduate School of Oceanography Pier. You see the location of that in the red dot of the map. And then in the lower uh, image is a drone photograph indicating the location of that shed on the pier. And then this is what the uh, things look like um, on the pier. We're pumping water from outside of that house from depth um, through um, over the time we've had a diaphragm pump. We're currently using a, a peristaltic pump. Um, and that moves into this imaging flow cytobot that you see on uh, your right hand side here. So you can also see all of the images that we've collected through the entire time series. We uh, did some laboratory sampling back in the summer of 2017, but deployed the instrument continuously on the pier in the fall of 2017, and it's been there ever since. Uh, so there's a lot of images that you could go and take a look at. You can find the location of this dashboard by the website down below, going to my lab website. Uh, we have a link for the IFCB uh, to be able to find this dashboard there. So how does this work? All of these images, um, to then translate them to identifying their taxonomy, and I'm also gonna talk about their, their morphology. So there's a image processing pipeline that happens that takes those images and looks for all kinds of different features. So here you see in that, that center image there, outlining the perimeter of the cell and then extracting what's called the blob of the cell. Um, so there's all kinds of different measures, about 250 different features for every single cell that's imaged uh, related to their morphology um, and the different coloration of the cells. All of these things are then um, important in the identification of these in an uh, uh, automated way. So a subset of these cells are manually annotated. Um, and so uh, Jessica Carney has done a lot of this work for us. She was trained in taxonomy. And so she looked through over 22,000 images uh, she annotated uh, during that time with us to train the uh, machine learning algorithm that then auto classifies these algorithms, um, or sorry, these images. So we then, we run the, this auto class and we look at the statistical analysis to estimate um, the misclassification probability. And then this is a continuous um, refinement process that we go back in and we say, okay, here's where it was confused. Let's annotate more of those, those images to try to refine the, the learning process there. And then once we're happy with how that's performing, we go ahead and apply all of those, um, uh, th that machine learning process pipeline to all of the unknown images. So then we're able to identify the majority of uh, what is in our, our image database. So I'm gonna show you the examples for these, these HAB species that I mentioned. So what I'm showing you right now is how the auto classifier performs on these different species. As you see, Dinophysis, we're doing awesome. 100% accuracy there. It's because the cell is so unique in its shape and its uh, contrast coloration there that it's not getting confused with anything else. In the center, you see Margolepidinium. And you see that while we're over 97% accurate, which is fantastic, there is some confusion that's happening. And let me just show you uh, why. So here's an example of what it's being confused with. Um, the different uh, cells that you see colored in our on the legend are then colored the same on the top there. So you can see that these are very densely um, colored or high contrast um, cells. And so the machine learning is confusing between these two in some situations. And then finally, our pseudonychia there, we're doing greater than 99% accuracy, uh, but there are some things that are um, confused with none, unclassified images. You can imagine with the, the millions and millions of images that we've uh, produced over uh, the years that not everything is classified yet, even though this is a continuous in improvement. But nonetheless, um, we're doing quite well with these different species. And then I wanted to show you, so we're not just doing these species, we're doing kind of 
uh, everything else that we're able to identify. So these generally are falling within our microplankton that have uh, defining features that we're able to see with this technology. And so you see for the majority of these um, different groups that we're doing really well, greater than 95% accuracy, but there's some that are, are providing a challenge. Um, the light purple that you see here are unclassified. So this is where it's getting confused with things that just aren't uh, classified in what we've been able to annotate thus far. And then you'll see that the from your left, uh, the one with the largest bar down there is Eucampia, um, that it's really having a hard time with the unclassified. And then the one with the, the greatest error is Catasphorus. And those of you that know Catasphorus know how um, how large the morphological variability is within that species. We've parsed out groups by um, those that are curly, those that are single cell, those that are straight, um, but it's still confusing a bit, particularly for the, the straight species. So this is a work in progress to continue to refine that performance. But I wanted to show you this because I'm gonna show you some of how these halves fit into the larger community a little later on. So here are the time series that we're able to pull out from those, those image data sets for those target species that, that I showed you. Um, it would really be ideal if we could connect these observations with abundance thresholds uh, like Alexis showed us. However, this is not as straightforward with this technology. Um, and let me show you why. So for Margolepidinium here, you see uh, the example furthest to your left has multiple cells in that chain. Uh, the other images there is a single cell and one that has you know, maybe four cells to it. The way that this technology is working is it's counting images. So the, the very long chain will count one image, not the eight to 10 different cells that are in that image. Um, and then the same thing for um, all chain forming species. So you see examples here of Pseudonychia where a single cell would be con uh, counted as an image versus you know, longer chains are counted as a single image. So what that results in is our abundance estimates are underestimated. It's possible to get around this by taking averages about how long we think the chain length is for these different species and whatnot. And maybe over time, we'll, we'll get closer and closer to being able to provide more precise abundance estimates. But for now, we're counting images, not numbers of cells necessarily. So I wanted to show you how this fits into the greater um, phytoplankton community. And I do want to qualify this to, to let you know that this is really the microplankton community that I'm comparing this with, that they're are um, a good portion of our, our data set, like I showed you in the very beginning, that are the really small cells that can't be differentiated um, by this imagery alone, that we'd need um, an electron microscope to be able to go to that next level. So we're, we're really focusing here on the microplankton for this example. So you see the, the mixed community over time of our record, and I'm gonna just point out to you where these different have species fall. So here I've highlighted some significant Pseudonychia events from the time series. Um, here was where we see some Dinophyses events happening and then uh, the sole Margolepidinium bloom that happened in August of 2018 in our, in our record. Uh, so you can see that they're actually a fairly small um, component of the overall phytoplankton composition nonetheless still um, important to the ecology and the, the toxin exposure. So I'm gonna highlight some of the work that Jessica Carney did. She uh, focused in on the market lepidinium bloom that happened in August of 2018. And I think that's why it captured her attention. She uh, was just arriving in Rhode Island to begin her master's degree at that time and showed up and the majority of the bay was uh, colored this dark brown. Um, so that was very striking to her and she was really curious to understand why and what led to those, those um, conditions. So she's broken up her time series. The very top here, you see them with the Margolepidinium um, abundance or images per milliliter that the, the IFCB uh, counted. And she broke up the periods um, prior to the bloom, kind of leading up to the bloom, during the bloom, and then and, and post bloom to be able to look at her analysis. And she pulled all kinds of environmental data from the region that had simple, sorry, similar 
temporal resolution. So you see her temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, uh, water height as an indication of tide, solar radiation, precipitation, wind speed. And so what she did um, was identify which of those environmental drivers were most important in uh, leading up to the Margolefidinium bloom. So she did, what you're seeing here is the results of her generalized linear model. Uh, she found that salinity was the biggest driver of uh, why the bloom happened at that time. Of course, chlorophyll and dissolved oxygen were also significant here, um, but all of you know that as we are uh, creating a bloom or adding more chlorophyll to the system, and of course, photosynthesizing and, and uh, creating dissolved oxygen. So those two things were not necessarily surprising. Um, and at the bottom, what you see here is kind of the before and during differences of these significant parameters. So you see the big change that happened in salinity um, leading up to the bloom, that decrease in salinity leading to the increase in the margolepidinium. Um, here. And I'm going to mention that she did not include temperature in this, this particular analysis because she found that the collinearity between temperature and salinity uh, didn't allow to include both. And she uh, left the salinity in because of the greater variability uh, at that time. And then she also looked at the community composition during these different time periods. She used an analysis of similarity to calculate the percent dissimilarity between each period. Um, and also a similar percentage analysis to determine which species drove the dissimilarity between each period. When she intercompared these periods with a simple analysis, she found that the non-bloom and post-bloom periods had the highest average dissimilarity at almost 80%, followed by the bloom versus post-bloom periods at 73%. All of the periods were dominated by diatoms. However, the dominating diatom in the non-bloom period was skeletonema and the dominating diatom in the post-bloom period was leptocylindrus. The bloom uh, versus post-bloom periods had the second highest dissimilarity, and this was driven by the rise of the flagellates uh, cryptophytes, but also the dinoflagellate margolepidinium. Okay, so I'm gonna transition now to a different example, and this is now the work of uh, Virginia Sonnet, who's working on her PhD in my lab. Virginie uh, joined us as an intern um, early on when we had first deployed this instrumentation and all of the uh, taxonomy identification had not uh, gotten to a place of maturity for her to be able to use it quite yet at that point. So she transitioned her focus into the morphology that we could certainly work with without having the taxonomy um, completed. And so she really dug into this uh, pretty deeply uh, and found some very uh, fascinating things. So I wanted to share that with you here. So we have over 110 million images, um, over 250 features for each of those images. So there's an enormous amount of data here to dig through to figure out what to do with this. And so to make this more realistic, um, she first had to subsample the data. She randomly chose 5% of the total samples and randomly extracted 250 images per sample since the variation between the replicates converged with the sample size. And so no greater, uh, no more images were needed beyond that. She also focused in on a subset of those um, features. She used 45 morphological features um, because these were uh, relevant to the whole cell and not part of the image, hence having a lot more importance ecologically. So she then ran a, a principal component analysis to identify which of the main morphological features um, were most relevant uh, in the data set that we had. And then um, she found that, uh, I'm gonna just show you these and then I'll come back to the top here. She found that the um, size or elongation of the cells, thickness and regularity were the most important features. She then applied these features to the subsetted images and then reprojected them onto the whole data set. So what you see at the bottom with the principal component analysis is an example of how those features were used to determine this. So on the x-axis on the, the image on your left, you see an example of a very small cell and how that goes to a large cell with these different features. 
And then likewise on the, the Y axis, um, a fairly thin cell uh, going up to a much thicker cell. And then on your right, you see what she's terming regularity or cells that are um, highly variable, uh, as you see on, on the, the left-hand side of that, moving to something that's far more regular, all based on these morphological features that she's extracted from um, the images that I've shared with you. So when she went and reprojected this all on our, our time series, you can see here the regularity, thickness, and size of the cells and how it varied through our time series. So I'm going to connect that to some of these events that I pointed out to you for these different HAB species um, briefly here. So let's consider that Margolephidinium bloom that happened in August of 2018. This was... Um, that same analysis or the same time period that Jessica Carney's work um, was from that I just shared with you. During that time frame, Margolephidinium composed about 8% of the community. So if we consider the regularity associated with the community with that associated with Margolephidinium, we see that Margolephidinium is mostly impacted by the regularity. Sorry, I meant to pull that one up here. So when you look at, um, let me just rephrase what I just said there. When you look at these figures, the, the salmon color is all the data, which corresponds to the time series that you're seeing now in the back. And the um, teal color there is uh, how those different parameters or those features um, look for that particular species, in this case, Margolephidinium. So you see that size and thickness don't vary much for that species, but the regularity does during that time period. And then let's look at an uh, event, um, this of Pseudonychia, uh, since we heard so much about Pseudonychia prior. This was one of the largest uh, events that we had in um, this two-year record that Virginia was focusing on. This happened in late May, early June of 2019. And during that time, the Pseudonychia was around 7% of the phytoplankton community. So when we take a look here again, these are similar plots that you just saw with all the data in salmon and Pseudonychia and teal that uh, the regularity increased and the thickness and size decreased as the Pseudonychia um, were blooming. And then Virginia took this further and connected it to uh, environmental uh, parameters. So the correlation with these different morphological features. So you see size on your left, thickness in the middle and regularity on your right. And then the correlation with temperature on the top, salinity in the middle and light on the bottom. And she's highlighted here where, um, where you see color or red, it's, it's uh, positively correlated. And uh, where it's blue, it's significantly negatively correlated. And where it's grayed out, the, the relationship was not significant. So I'm going to take a look here at how those different time periods look for these different environmental influences. So if we take that Margolephidinium bloom, um, we see here uh, that salinity was important to their size and temperature is important to their thickness and none of these environmental parameters were important to regularity. So if we recall from Jessica Carney's analysis, she also pointed to the importance of salinity during this bloom, but temperature was removed from her analysis because of the collinearity with salinity. So it's um, reaffirming to see these relationships uh, showing up in this different approach here. And then finally, I'll show you the example for uh, Pseudonychia that we find that temperature was important to size and thickness when uh, that species was blooming, but regularity uh, was not impacted by these environmental parameters. So those are just some examples I wanted to share with you about how we're using this imagery um, as it's related to harmful algal blooms. And there's certainly much, much more to be done. I wanted to point out that our site at the GSO Pier is part of this National Harmful Algal Bloom Observing Network um, that Woods Hole is the uh, lead on. And they have this uh, web resource, this HAB Hub. You can see the website there on the bottom where you can go and look at um, some different mapping tools and, and data set um, time series tools for visualization. And then finally, there's if, if this piques your interest, you found all of these images fascinating. Um, Virginie put together this beautiful wiki where you can go and 
look at um, the IFCB images and uh, she's connected that with their identification, but then also provided the microscopy examples as well. Uh, likewise, it's a great resource that uh, Virginie organized from a lot of the work that Jessica Carney did in, in the identification here. So I just wanna end with a prospectus that I provided a few examples of the studies that we've done um, that are determined from this high throughput particle imaging and how these can be used to understand HAB events. But there are so many more ways that we could uh, use this data. This could be focusing on particular species, the compositional shifts and the related environmental and ecological events, phonology succession in combination with many tools such as optics, omics, modeling, um, and I, I am not able to share with you today because of the length of time, but the majority of what we do in my lab is connect the phytoplankton composition to optical signatures to um, eventually uh, apply this to satellite remote sensing detection. So I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share uh, what we've been up to with you. And here, I just wanna acknowledge all the staff and students that have kept that instrument running. Um, it's a joy to see those images and all of the diversity that's out there, but it's it's also sometimes a heartache when things aren't working and it, it consumes your, your days uh, trying to figure out what the problem is. And then I do wanna mention on the, the support that we received from Rhode Island Sea Grant, uh, Melissa Oman and some collaborators from Brown University were involved in um, a segment of the, the visualization of uh, what we were observing. So the support from the work came from Rhode Island Sea Grant, also from the Rhode Island Sea AIM program, and a portion of the funding um, is also from NASA. So I thank you, and please, you know, visit my 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 website where you can find uh, links to all of the resources that I shared with you today. So I will stop sharing, and I think we're going to transition into the Q and A period. All right, thank you everyone um, for joining us again and for all of our guest speakers. Those were really great presentations. Um, if you have questions, because I know we have some that we, we already have collected, but um, please use the chat or the Q&A option as we kind of roll into this Q&A session. And so before I kind of get into what some of uh, some folks have put down, I just was hoping that you guys might be able to clarify kind of how do we define a harmful algal bloom because we're talking about cell counts and or I'm thinking in terms of cell counts can you have kind of a situation where it's not technically a bloom so I guess clarify how do we define a bloom and whether that necessarily applies to some of these uh, species that produce toxins. I'm going to actually ask Alexa to answer this question for Sudanichia because um, one thing that we didn't mention um, in introductions is URI has a really strong um, training program in marine policy. And not only is Alexa working on her PhD, she holds a master's degree in marine affairs and really pays attention to sort of uh, the regulatory side of some of these harmful algal wounds. And so Again, for Sudanichia, there's there's kind of two metrics. There's cells, and then there's toxin. And I'm going to pass the baton to you, Alexa, to flush that out. All right. Thanks, Bethany. So first, harmful algal blooms are in the perspective of humans, right? So the diatoms and the phytoplankton, they're they're living their best lives in the water. And as we pointed out that this can have unexpected consequences for the economics of shellfish harvesting and for human illness. But the phytoplankton, their goal isn't to make humans sick. Uh, so harmful algal bloom, the term itself is very human centric. Um, and there, there can be regular blooms without harmful effects too. Uh, and depending on the region, there's different thresholds for the cell counts. So I would say that it's really defined by the impact that it has on human communities being a harmful algal bloom. I've seen some great questions in the chat about freshwater harmful algal blooms, marine algal blooms, uh, things like 
in the shellfish taking it up, there's different dynamics by the shellfish species. Some shellfish retain the toxins for longer. So some species may be safe to eat while others still are toxic. So I'd say the dynamics of what really defines a harmful algal bloom is complicated, but it's important to remember that it's human focused. I Can don't you know talk a little bit about the regulatory part in Rhode Island, how Rhode Island DEM defines it? Sure. So Rhode Island DEM has a three-step monitoring program where there is an action threshold set for the cell counts. And uh, regionally, different states have different levels for cells. So there's different cell threshold levels for Washington state and for Maine. Um, but based on the best scientific literature and the local ecosystem, the scientists and managers make a decision for the local region. And if the cells exceed that action threshold, then that means that the managers will test the plankton for cell associated toxins through the Scotia rapid tests. And if that rapid test is positive, then that would trigger the shellfish meat. And this is all sort of on an individual case by case basis. I think looking at the precautionary closure in 2016, there's other decisions and pieces that go into this um, with the overall goal of protecting human health and livelihoods. I think what's also interesting is that shellfish left in the water during a harmful algal bloom like Pseudonychia may be missed income, but for someone like an aquaculturist, if the shellfish are left and they're alive, they can naturally purge the toxin over time as the bloom subsides. If a shellfish is harvested and then is tested and found to be toxin, toxic, it's missed income because that shellfish will not make it to market. Um, so all of these pieces of information go into decisions like that. Actually, that kind of falls into one of the first questions that was asked by Chris Bassett in terms of clarifying why we had these closures in uh, recent years, but in previous years, um, we didn't when the data was similar. So I guess, would you agree that the data was similar or can you answer that? I would, I'll answer it in that I think the cell data might have been similar, but the toxin data was not. And so that's what's new is the, the, the higher levels of demoic acid in the 2016 and 2017 years. And one of the other questions um, regarding to Nichia, the, the reason why it produces uh, demoic acid, is it um, kind of in relation to competition or is it, um, I think TJ Stevenson had asked, or is it possibly a waste product or a degradation product or something else? Like what's its function? I think that's still a really open question. It, because it's a small product, we think it's perhaps the byproduct of, of metabolism. And really recently there's been some characterization on some of the genes that may lead to its production, but a lot of nutrient stress pathways can lead to lead to the production of demoic acid. So it's, it's partially a, a natural function, but there's some really interesting data showing that the presence of bacteria actually creates more toxin at times. And I'm not sure um, if enough work's been done with grazers of phytoplankton to know if it's what we call alleopathic with um, grazing interactions. And I know what were the species that in both presentations that we're talking about are more marine based, but one of the questions was, does any of this carry over to freshwater ecosystems? Is there any kind of connection between what we're seeing here in the marine environment and in the freshwater environment? I guess I'm not sure which connections we're thinking of here, but I do have some experience working in freshwater. I spent a number of years working on the Great Lakes and had a project um, working in the Western Lake Erie um, harmful algal bloom uh, situation there as well. And so the tools that we're talking about, I think are very relevant no matter which system that you're working in. Um, but the situation, right? The context of them is different. Um, so I guess it would be helpful to have more clarification in the question beyond that. 
And one of the question, another question is, is there a worry that low levels of demoic acid in multiple pseudonychia species will accumulate to cause a bigger problem? Because you had mentioned that different species produce different levels, but if together, does that create a problem potentially? Yeah, so, you know, together, so when one thing our colleague Matt Burton is trying to do, which is really neat, is he does um, molecular mapping of, of isoforms and molecules. So one, one really cool question we want to answer with different pseudonychia strains and culture is do they all, all produce the same chemical form of demoic acid? So we can actually, can we take that demoic acid um, sample and see by molecular fingerprinting of the toxin, is there a mapping onto species? That's an open question right now. And so right now we're measuring the bulk output of all the species that may be producing toxin with the current method. Yeah, so you, oh. go ahead, Meredith. I was just going to say, you had mentioned um, uh, this kind of uh, ties in with the time series, Colleen, that you looked about like pre-bloom, bloom, like kind of the different stages of a bloom and kind of looking at those different environmental parameters. Did you see, was demoic acid production more likely at one stage of a bloom versus the other? Because I think when you had mentioned kind of nutrient stressing, I'm inclined to think towards the end of a bloom is when you would start seeing or where you would expect kind of to see these uh, levels of demoic acid. But, I, but I'm just wondering if that's true. Um, Alexa, I'm not sure we have resolution in our data quite yet to answer that question in terms of the timing between sort of cell abundances and, and peak toxin. We are, are um, generally, I would say for the listeners on this call, so we're measuring toxin weekly at mostly this year, especially during COVID at the time series site. So we've had to kind of curtail some of our, our sampling that we hope to bring online when we can do more in-person work. And so essentially we're, we're um, looking weekly and generally we see very low levels of demoic acid or almost undetectable levels in Narragansett Bay. So that, that's our baseline is zero, which is good. And then when we see these peaks, they happen rapidly. So they happen over the course of a few weeks and go back down. And so how that correlates with sort of what we consider the peak in, in bloom, we, we haven't, I would say we haven't really dissected that yet. One of the other questions is about how the harmful algal bloom that we're talking about in the context of pseudonychia and demoic acid is different from, they had pointed to um, an event in North Carolina in the late 1990s um, that resulted in large fish kills. I'm assuming that the difference is in uh, there, we're talking about toxin production versus a dissolved oxygen issue. So if you could elaborate more and, and like just to clarify why what we're talking about as a harmful algal bloom is different to maybe others that cause fish kills. I'll, I'll answer the first half and maybe Colleen, you can chime in because you look at, at some of the um, causative agents of those, those fish kills that come up with, with low oxygen in your data set. So yeah, the, the, I, the problem with HABs is it, it's, it's a general term for a lot, a lot of these, what we call phytoplankton induced problems. And the pseudonychia is unique. And then there's some other, other uh, photosynthetic algae that live in the marine system that cause, um, you know, toxins that really disrupt our digestive system, you know, so the pathologies of the toxins are really different. And so they're all kind of lumped together. And so I mentioned that there's some HABs where if the cells are in the water, the cells always make toxins. So it's a, it's a direct relationship of cell abundances to toxin production. And again, because the pseudonychia species vary in their toxin production and then they control their toxin production, that, that, that's unique and, and it's a unique toxin because it impacts the nervous system. And the, um, 
oxygen problems are a biomass problem. And, and Colleen probably has some awesome examples of that in Lake Erie and, and from some of the ones that impact fish. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't have anything right off the top of my head that I, I can share directly um, about, but I just, for our, our approach, I just want to mention that sometimes, you know, we're, we're the high temporal piece of what we're doing, there's only so many other parameters that we have at that high temporal resolution. And so the value in which Bethany and Alexa's um, analysis, where they're able to bring in so many more parameters that we don't necessarily have high temporal instrumentation to measure, to reveal these connections that we might not see when just looking at the parameters that I, I had mentioned um, prior. So I, I don't have a great answer other than there's different tools that you need for different pieces of this and all of it is, is really critical to understanding the bigger picture. So how much, or I guess how comfortable would any of you be linking, be in linking, um, these species, like the various species of Pseudonychia with climate change, you're, you're connecting it with warming temperatures. And I know within fisheries, we've talked a lot about kind of species migration northward. Um, would you feel safe in saying that there is a connection with these climate changes to these species that we're seeing in possible future um, events with demogas gas and maybe other toxins? can take a stab at that, um, especially with Pseudonychia australis from the blob event, I think it was in 2019 along the West Coast, warming temperatures was one thing that they were pointing the finger out with Pseudonychia australis making up a large portion of the toxic population, which was something that I thought of when we started to see Pseudonychia australis in the March 2017 closure samples in Narragansett Bay. But interestingly, those were some of the coldest temperatures that we had in the Bay. Uh, so I would say that it's it's something that's interesting and pot, you know, we're finding some of these new ranges of these newly observed species for the region, but it's likely a little bit more complicated than that. All right, and so from the audience, another question is, what is the effect from a street from the street level of non-point source pollution in the bay in terms of worsening any bloom events or pseudonychia or demoic acid production. So where are the connections there, if any? I'm, I'm not sure. But it's a good question. Yeah, I you know, I wasn't sure if maybe in one of your parameters it was looking at um, because I know we had some nitrogen reduction um, efforts underway in the bay, um, and as a, as a nutrient, would that tie into to Pseudonychia? So I think it's a great question. I think it's important to note too, when I think of inputs, I think of uh, things like that from the upper bay, and our most northern site was about mid-bay at the top of Prudence Island. Um, so we might not be getting the sort of things um, like those high pollution or higher pollution sources from Upper Bay, uh, but we do separate out our nitrogen speciation values, which uh, can tell us something about sources like that. And, and I will say that the sites where we detect the highest amounts of toxin tend to be at the mouth of the bay. So we see Alexa showed really nice data where the sites acted very similarly, but the absolute levels tend to be when we start sampling closer to the mouth in Narragansett Bay, which is really interesting to me because it suggests that there's perhaps species that are getting evicted from some offshore water in, and entrained in the Narragansett Bay ecosystem that are participating in these toxic events. And so, you know, it makes it even more challenging to, to decipher in the background of just what's going on with sort of our, our data sets that are really kind of, you know, in the, in the bay, so to speak. I guess I have a counter to that from the example that I shared with Margo Lepidinium, the connection to salinity, um, but we did not see a relationship with precipitation. And so what we, um, the only thing we could assume was the fresh water from up in the northern part of the bay moving to the south. And we know that a lot of that particular species is found in, in coves and embayments. And so I think that 
perhaps that um, you know upper bay to lower bay influence was was a big piece of why that bloomed so prolifically. So I think it really depends on the species that we're talking about. All right, so another question is, domoic acid has been classified as a carbon-rich algal toxin as opposed to nitrogen-rich algal toxin. Um, and so if there's a negative correlation between nitrate and domoic acid, would you expect to see a similar relationship with other nitrogen sources like ammonium or urea? Uh, so I'll take this. This is actually from one of my former lab mates from undergrad, Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Um, and Ben is also a PhD candidate studying HABs at Stony Brook. Uh, so great question. <laughs> uh, we did measure ammonium and I didn't show it, but ammonium is right under nitrate in that PCA plot. Uh, we originally had it as just total dissolved in organic nitrogen, but it does seem that nitrate and then ammonium are uh, some of the highest negative correlations with domoic acid production. Urea is something that we haven't measured yet. And I think Bethany mentioned this in the chat that that would be really interesting to look at with um, some of what we've been talking about with the wastewater treatment plants further up in the bay. Domoic acid does have nitrogen in it. So it is a little counterintuitive to think of as low nitrogen may increase toxin production with a toxin that doesn't have a large need for nitrogen, but it does have a need. Um, and there's been other studies that have shown that there's really species specific responses to the nitrogen sources that these diatoms are using. Um, so I think nitrogen is a great thing for us to continue diving into. And I'm really happy that the two year data set gave us some great hypotheses to work off of. And actually, speaking of data sets, Colleen, I wanted to ask you, what is and this isn't really a scientific question. This is more like a tech question because you're obtaining so much information. Like how, how are you storing this? Or like, what's, yeah, like what's the kind of power, manpower, you know, energy that you're going to need to maintain, which, which, what sounds like, or seems like a digitized visual version of what the Narragansett long-term plankton series has been so far. Like, it just seems like a lot of com computing power that's going to be needed. Yeah, and I guess, um, <laughs> you know, this part does not make me uncomfortable whatsoever, because the majority of the research that I have been involved in in my past has been with satellite data, and there you're also producing um, terabytes of information. So it's, um, to me, not that tenuous of a problem. I mean, our, our data set for the IFCB at the, the GSO peer is about um, 1,000 gigabytes at this point. Um, and so a lot of it is just knowing you can't look at all of it. Um, and we do a lot of coding and, you know, data storage and we're storing it all locally and backed up uh, redundantly and whatnot. But um, I'd say the majority of my students are really interested in quantitative approaches to for big data. So we uh, recognizing you can't look at all of this. So you have to have, you know, these, these computational approaches to, to managing it. Whatnot. And that information is all available to the public, correct? All of the IFCB images, yes, you could go download every single one of them if you wanted. Um, it is freely available on this dashboard to take a look at. So please do go and investigate that. And I just want to make a plug for this data set and instrument because like I said, we the time series goes out on a weekly basis, right? And so the IFCB is in the water all the time. And so we see things going on on a daily basis and Colleen's resource and the resource her team's developed, we can look at from our desks. So again, we've had this pandemic and we've had, you know, kind of eyes in the water that we can all be following, you know, for those of us that, you know, might want to go out when there's a pseudonychia of loom and isolate cells, this is such a valuable tool for our research community. And then these images, I do encourage the public to look at them, they're beautiful. I look at it every morning <laughs> with my morning copy. Um, well, I actually wanted to jump back to one of the previous questions about freshwater to add some of the clarity um, that he provided. Really, it was, can, can we say that you're finding support in the notion that freshwater algae species also respond to warming waters, 
um, or the presence of bacteria, um, kind of like the same parameters that affect Sweetenitch and other marine species, would you expect kind of the same response in freshwater species? I believe, Alan, forgive me if, I, if I'm misinterpreting that, but I believe that's what he was trying to care or get to. Yeah, I guess so my experiences with microcystis in, in uh, Western Lake Erie and temperature, like when you when we've distilled all this data, essentially, if you know where you are in the calendar, you can predict the bloom based on just uh, climatic um, you know, the temperature regimes that, that happen in that region of the country. So yes, temperature is a huge piece of it, um, but also nutrient supply. But Western Lake Erie is a very shallow system, um, you know, eight to 12 feet of water. So any type of mixing does not take a very large event that the whole water column mixes very easily because there's just not that much of it. And so you're resuspending these nutrients continuously and it's heating very quickly. So it's just like a a perfect uh, storm of conditions that lead to that bloom. And Beth, or Bethany, I know you answered this question within the Q&A, but I just want to put it out for everyone. Is it possible to conduct manipulative studies with these plankton taxa? Can you obtain cultures of Sudanitia and subject them to different, uh, like we were just talking about the temperatures, salinity, nitrate values, um, to kind of determine the causality behind these correlations? Or are you basically continuing to collect observational data to build a better understanding of the drivers and um, high toxin producing periods? Yeah, we're trying to do both. And um, certainly we've had a lot of colleagues come before us that have characterized um, some of the common Pseudonychia species, Pseudonychia australis, Pseudonychia multi-series. Again, a lot of these cells are in high abundances on the West Coast and have been brought into culture and people have done really nice physiological studies, which is how that slide that had kind of the bouncing balls of nutrients to show the relationship with Pseudonychia, that's been determined by a lot of hard work by a lot of different scientists growing these in culture, where what we're trying to do, because because this is such a new question in the Narragansett Bay system and that um, the, the, the low levels of toxin in some ways are, are typically low levels of toxin aside from 2016 and 2017 are great for the ecosystem, but they make it really hard to study without some of the sensitive toxin measurement that we've been, um, that, that Matt Burton's group has brought online. And so, we're trying to isolate our resident Narragansett Bay species into culture and have a lead on some of those and then conduct some of these studies for some of the species that Alexa talked about. So we're um, kind of following on the coattails of some of these other studies, but because our species are different, we just don't know yet. Yeah, and I was going to ask like kind of the follow up of this research because it was all prompted to kind of get a better handle or from a rate from a, excuse me, a regulatory perspective on how we can better predict, predict or anticipate these events. Um, and so one of the other comments was that considering that we're, you had observed these denoic acid counts near the mouth of the bay, um, that would seem to suggest um, expanding research to include offshore sites um, and in the upper bay to pinpoint whether this is just a Bay issue or how much from like Rhode Island Sound is really being an input. And I guess what other areas of research do you think would be the next steps to help DM or other regulatory goal of, of better understanding these, these species and events? Yeah, this is a really great question. And it gives me a chance to highlight another awesome Sea Grant funded project that is being led by Dr. David Ullman and Dr. Lucy Miranda who we did collaborate a little bit with um, for some of our DNA samples that Dr. Miranda collected. Uh, they also had several sites throughout the Bay to look specifically at this question of whether Rhode Island Sound is uh, inputting Pseudonychia species into the Bay. And I know that they're working on a manuscript about that. Uh, so they had some more offshore sites and some of the data that I didn't show today were some of those sequence samples from those further offshore sites. Um, so people are working, really great people are working on that. And then additionally, 
uh, we have been fortunate enough to team up with the Northeast Shelf LTER cruises that just started in 2018, I believe. And they typically leave from the GSO dock and they go beyond uh, the shelf break past Martha's Vineyard in a transect line of about, uh, I think, 10 or 15 stations. So we've been able to collect over, uh, so those cruises happen about four times a year and we've been able to collect the winter and summer samples for a few years now to give us an even better view of what Pseudonychia species and uh, cell associated toxins are beyond the shelf break. And we, we have seen some demoic acid uh, further offshore and we've seen the notorious Pseudonychia australis. <laughs> So, so yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Colleen, where do you see in terms of kind of, you know, this data set and these imaging sensors, is it just like there, do you have kind of the shop set up now and it's just collecting or is there another kind of structural or infrastructure phase or I don't even know how to articulate that, <laughs> but like what's the next phase of that or is it just kind of, doing its job and now it's just time. Well, I think I, I can fill in where, what you're getting at here. So I, I do want to mention that in addition to the imaging plus cytobot that's down on the dock, the group from um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute that is running the HAB Hub has a McLean ESP or environmental sample processor also uh, deployed in the same time. So they're very interested in um, doing their own toxin sampling in conjunction with the IFCB record that we have. So I'm very curious to see what they learn from having um, that coincidence um, and also the uh, increased frequency because they're not going um, on a, a ship and dependent on, on those resources. The other piece of, and really the big motivation of why I'm doing this um, for my own research is I'm really interested in connecting to next generation uh, satellite remote sensing. So we're, uh, NASA's next mission is planned to be a hyperspectral mission. And so you'll have a lot more spectral information to uh, dis decipher phytoplankton composition and all kinds of other aspects uh, that color the, the ocean. And so what I see what our, we're contributing is this coincident uh, phytoplankton composition data set and this optical data set, which I wasn't able to share with you today um, because of the focus and time constraints, but bringing those together, really understanding the relationships of how um, that composition is impacting those critical optical um, characteristics that then translate to how we apply that um, and develop algorithms for satellite remote sensing application. I also want to plug CAIM here because we're building a, an observatory right at the time series site in Narragansett Bay that's going to have a lot of instruments to collect high resolution nutrient data. So we'll have nutrients over really, really um, fine temporal scales, as well as the ability to adaptively sample and filter water to capture cells and demoic acid. So, you know, we can be, you know, monitoring off the IFCB and do event triggered sampling, which is going to be really exciting. And so that that infrastructure is being led by Dr. Andy Davies on behalf of CAIM. So that's going to really augment some of our in-bay capabilities, which I'm super excited about. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's all the questions that I see from the chat and the Q&A. Um, so I just want to thank the three of you for taking the the time this afternoon to share with all of us your your really amazing and interesting work um, and i'm actually really looking forward to seeing how all of this progresses and where the information goes so thank you again if unless is there anything else that you wanted to add that i don't want to cut you off if there's something that we might have missed i just wanted to thank c grant and c aim for supporting this work um, c grant's been really committed to you know, elevating our understanding of, of HABs locally. And that's that's been fantastic um, as a source of support. And I think, you know, stay tuned. Um, we're getting ready to publish and Lex is the lead on that publication for the Pseudonychia work. So we'll be letting everybody know when that's in the literature. Okay, great. And, and 
Meredith, thank you for hosting this, this uh, opportunity here to share. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure. And again, um, I really appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, and again, we will be record this is being recorded, so we'll be able to share this at a later date. And I just want to, again, thank our speakers, um, as well as our co-sponsors, the University of Rhode Island College of Environment and Life Sciences and the Graduate School of Oceanography, and again, the Rhode Island EPSCOR um, CAIM Consortium. So thank you again for everyone joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week.